Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, where we will be discussing the relevance of real-time data in retail banking. My name is Stacey Gorkoff, and I am the VP of Marketing at INECO. And this is Dan. Oh, sorry, and this is Dan Lattimore. Uh, I lead the banking practice at Selen. Great, Dan. Uh, welcome, and we're very, very excited to, that you'll be joining us today. Taking a quick look at what we'll be talking about, um, Dan will be taking us through some of his research around real-time data, why it is important, and what it would take for a bank to implement a re real-time data strategy. Uh, he will also spend some time discussing potential approaches banks should take when it comes to real-time data analytics. Then I think I have the easier part. I will walk you through some of the more popular use cases um, that we have encountered at INETCO, and then we can end with a Q&A period. Um, but at any time during this presentation, if you feel like sharing your questions with us, please do. And then also, there are some poll questions that will be littered throughout this presentation. If you look below the actual presentation screen, you'll see that you can vote right below that, and we'll remind you of how to do that as we go on here. And at this point, I'll hand it over to Dan, and Dan, you can take over. Great. Well, thank you very much, Stacey, and thanks to Netco. We are delighted to be talking with you on this very topical subject. In, in fact, it's an ongoing internal discussion that we have at Stellant on how necessary real time is in, in banking. Um, and part of the challenge, I think, is, is kind of definitional, and it's very helpful to think about what it is we actually mean. So for us, we want to start out with beginning to answer the question of what is real-time data? Um, and it's you know, important to distinguish between real-time on the one hand and real-time data on the other hand. Uh, real-time data enables all sorts of other real-time stuff. Um, but I think we sometimes get ourselves confused by talking about it there as well. Um, you know, one of the things that lots of analysts do, me included, is head straight to Wikipedia uh, when we want to start seeing what others are saying about the subject. And when was the last time you saw a two-page Wikipedia entry? Real-time data is really sparse on Wikipedia. And for those of you who want to make your name, uh, this is, I think, a place where there is a lot to be said. Um, and when we have more time, maybe we'll do it at Selland. Um, but it's suggest that there has not been a lot of time spent or really that it's not settled yet what real time is all about. Um, but, you know, why is real time important? Part of it is because of all the other instances and all the other situations consumers are exposed to that require real time. So think of the absurdity of Uber saying, hey, just wait while I batch your pickup request overnight or even, you know, in the next three-hour window. That just would not fly. And so the question then, or what you then kind of hear some people reflexively say is, oh, well, all of banking then has to be real time as well. And that is not the case. Real time is helpful in certain cases, but it is not needed for everything. And as we start to think about where it is needed, let's think about why, in fact, it's important. And you know, go back to the Uber example, um, consumers are expecting a lot more than they used to. But now let's think about first on the upper left-hand corner, data as a wasting asset. Um, there is some data that is, you know, going to be useful now and useful tomorrow and useful three years in the future. There is other data, though, and much more of it that is a wasting asset. That is, it's more valuable right now than it is going to be tomorrow uh, or even an hour from now. And real-time data is data that once it's done or once that window is passed, it's no longer useful at all. Um, and, and why is this important? Well, first of all, so much more of banking is contextual. And one of the critical components of context is time, temporal. Um, when you are walking down the street, for instance, and the local pizza joint is going to serve you up an offer, uh, it has to be when you are nearby. If you've gotten two blocks past them, 
no longer relevant. It will no longer work. Um, for the business itself, decision windows are very narrow, and actions delayed are just like actions that weren't taken at all. You never made that offer, or if you made it too late, why bother? And, in fact, you may, in fact, do harm because you have just suggested to your target customer that you just aren't competent, and they will discount what you say in the future. Um, and also, from the business perspective, new data points can change what it is that you as a business do next. So you ingest those data points in real time and act on them immediately, take different decisions than if the data had been something else. If we move on to the customer side of it, and all these things are intertwined, of course, by the way, but customers expect instant gratification, and sometimes the whole value proposition is based on instantaneousness. So, again, think about Uber. Um, in many cases, banks who don't offer at least the illusion of real time risk customer dissatisfaction. Um, so think about remote deposit capture when you take a picture of a check. Um, and even though I, being in the business, know what's going on behind the scenes, um, I, I at least get notification that my check is, has been acknowledged and is being processed, but it still is nettlesome. It irks me that I don't get access to those funds. And, you know, it's, it's regulation that is driving this. It's not the bank, but I'm still peeved, irrationally, I admit it, at my bank for not giving me access to that check, particularly when it's a business check, immediately. Um, and think about moving that into person-to-person -person payments, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, but there are also a lot more banking transactions that are contextual and happen um, immediately. And person-to-person -person payments is one of those. These offers are another, and we'll go into some more detail there. And, and fraud is another really important instance of, of real time, uh, particularly in the credit card space, um, because First of all, customers don't care about this until it happens to them, and then they care an awful lot, and they don't want to be inconvenienced. Oh, I could reduce fraud that's never happened to me if I did a second factor for authentication or if I got a, and got a QR code or a four- or six-digit code emailed or texted to me. But eh, it seems like a lot of work in that extra 15 seconds. Just eh, I don't want to do it. Um, and ultimately, customers expect the bank to, to take care of it rightly or wrongly, and you know, right now that's what will happen. Um, uh, whether that will change over time is something else to discuss, but it is on the bank to take care of the fraud in all its dimensions. So um, let me move on to the first poll here, and as a reminder, you can vote below the presentation screen. Just as a bit of benchmarking and level setting here, we'd like to see where you are currently using real-time data. We've got five choices. Um, the first is in fraud and advanced persistent threat detection, or APT. Number two is predictive operations maintenance. Third is omni-channel service delivery. Fourth is real-time mobile alerts and promotional offers. And fifth is either we don't or we're not sure that we use real-time data. So. Uh, Take a second there and think about it, uh, and we'll be discussing each of these in a little bit more detail. Um, Omnichannel service delivery could be an instance, by the way, where you might start opening an account on your phone but then go into the branch to finish it, and you want to make sure that the branch knows what you have been up to so far, or the call center, uh, for example. Matt, how are we doing on the poll question? Hi, Dan. So the results are coming in, and so far we're sitting at about 50% of our audience that have voted, um, saying that fraud and advanced persistent threat detection is is key to a, a current use case around their real-time data. Um, we're seeing about 17% of the audience, and that splits pretty much between predictive operations maintenance, omni-channel service delivery, and real-time mobile alerts and promotional offers. Each of those categories have about 17%, whereas fraud seems to definitely be the key um, key area. Oh, and it's shifting a little bit, but it still, it still seems to be fraud and APT detection. Okay. 
Great. So pretty interesting. Um, and no one has said that they are not sure if they use real-time data. So that is a, a good sign here and uh, a sign of an engaged and uh, practical audience. Mm -hmm. Great. So I think what we can do is start closing out this poll. Yep. Yeah, our voting has slowed down a little bit. We also see a bit of a shift um, happening with 29% now saying predictive operations maintenance, which is not surprising to me, you know, and, and we'll get into that a little bit more, but definitely with INECO, our first use cases have always been developed in more of an IT operations perspective or channel systems management perspective. So it's interesting. Good. Okay, great. So let's, let's keep on going. Um, you know, we, we think of two really important perspectives when, you, when you're analyzing or considering real time. One is the customer's perspective. And they want what they want, when they want it, with as little work as possible. And so go back to, you know, the reluctance to use two-factor authentication, for example. Um, payments is one area where there's a lot going on in real time. And if you've ever uh, gotten Venmoed something, uh, you know, it appears in your Venmo account immediately, um, and you've uh, apparently got access to it. Now, there's stuff that goes on behind behind the scenes that the consumer doesn't see, but from the consumer's perspective, that is real time. Uh, on the offer side, again, you're walking by that pizza place, and you get pushed out an offer. That had better be real time or it's not going to work. Uh, financial information. You're in the department store wondering whether you can splurge for that uh, that pair of shoes, you want to know if you have enough money in your account to do it, and that balance uh, you're assuming is real time, um, or you know whether or not uh, that remote deposit check has cleared. Um, and another interesting one is on the account opening side. Um, and this is you know, near real time, and we'll talk about these distinctions uh, in a bit, but there's a lot of talk these days about the uh, the drop-off rate of account opening and how few um, online and digital account opening processes that happen to actually get completed. Um, and if you aren't there in real time, um, you know, checking the validity of the driver's license that someone has just taken a picture of and doing your AML and KYC checks in close to real time uh, and really quickly, then you stand a good chance of having your customer get impatient and walk away from that account opening. So from the customer's perspective, they just want it all won and done um, and know that they can count on something uh, rather than having to wait some unspecified period of time. Um, from the bank's perspective, uh, it, it's a little bit different. There's both what's customer facing and what's bank internal, and sometimes these are related. So think about authorizing a credit card payment um, the, the bank has to do its analysis and make its assessment as to whether that pay card payment is going to go through, and then the customer gets the results of that in either an, a yay or nay on their credit card purchase. Um, the other thing is that if implementing real-time were free, we'd do it everywhere we possibly could. But it's not, of course, and you've got to make an assessment as to how big the benefits are of your real-time projects. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, and then there's you know, true real-time versus pseudo real-time and near real-time. Um, they're important distinctions and, and they're subtle, but they make a difference in terms of what you actually have to do. And in a lot of cases, um, we contend that pseudo real-time or near real-time are going to be good enough. But there are, very importantly, some instances, and this is what you've got to figure out internally, where real-time, true real-time is what you need. Um, and so I just emphasize real-time isn't just one thing. It is a concept that has a lot of applicability across a wide range of activities and processes in a bank. Um, but it doesn't need to be applied everywhere. But where it does or where it should be applied is really important and, and really interesting. So let's 
us move on to the next poll, and if you're extrapolating, we're not going to have 12 poll questions. Uh, this is, is two of three just to set your expectations. But the question is, what's your biggest challenge when it comes to using real-time data? So number one is data accessibility and serving up the right data for the right business unit. The second choice is data governance and unclear processes around who owns the data. Third is the inability to make a compelling business case. Four is cumbersome technology or lack of tools. And five is limited resources and skills uh, within the bank. So again, you can uh, vote down below the presentation slide, and um, we'll open that up now to begin voting. Thanks, Dan, and I'll just be watching the results here as they're coming in. There might be a little bit of a lag. Well, and you can tell it was uh, the American thing doing this poll because I said processes and not processes. <laughs> Duly noted by the Canadians up here. <laughs> Great white north. Um, okay, so we do have some results that have been starting to trickle in here. Um, data accessibility and serving up the right data for the right business unit is definitely one of the biggest challenges that people are, are facing today. And it seems like the second um, that well, they're actually equal now, is the limited resources and skills. And that's not surprising to me either. I think we hear that quite often echoed throughout um, a lot of our, our customers. It's like, okay, you know, putting real-time data solutions together are amazing, but who's going to run them? And, um, you know, making sure that the resources and the skill levels are matching the actual technology advancements has always been a bit of a challenge, I think. Okay, and we still see the limited resources and skills. No, it's now jumped ahead of the data accessibility issues and serving up the right data for the right business unit. Yeah, and that, that's not surprising. I mean, I think um, really anything these days around uh, technology in a bank uh, is a huge challenge from mm -hmm. getting the right resources and skills when there are all these um, other areas or other firms that are organized around technology as their core business rather than something that's viewed as an enabler in many cases. Mm -hmm. And I would also say those people that um, feel like they're struggling a bit with this inability to make a compelling business case, if there is any interest, um, contact myself or Dan directly, and I think we can both help you a little bit with that, or at least guide you towards some resources that can help. All right. All right. Um, Matt, Let's I think we close. can close this one out. Okay. Great. Terrific. So um, let me now start to talk a little bit about the, the distinctions and the different flavors of, of real time. So pseudo real time appears to customers like real time, um, but the the bank is is like the duck who's serene on the surface but paddling furiously underneath to make that serene progress. And so, like so much in technology, what seems simple to the customer is really complex on the back end. Um, and so, you know, the customer seems to get what they want, even though the bank may not have officially recorded it. So there's this disconnect between the systems of engagement and the systems of record. And while that works today, the, the bubble gum and bailing wire um, will get increasingly fragile as more and more demands are put on it. And, you know, at some point all it will take is one hiccup in the system and the whole thing will come crashing down. Um, and keeping it running uh, will require more and more heroic acts, and it will become more and more expensive. So there are a lot of instances today, and um, you know, think about P2P payments as one example, um, where you can get away with it, but the, the window for that is, is finite. Um, the, the near real time... Um, is very quick, but it does have some latency. And in some instances, you can kind of get away with that and say that it's due to uh, the network um, and the like. 
Um, and in many cases, the customers don't need the, the real-time response, but it's pretty close to real-time. Um, and that, that might be things like credit decisioning or opening an account um, or, or even blockchain. Um, but what seems good enough today, and you know, eight or ten seconds may not seem like a lot, um, over time will become more and more noticeable. So you know, the basic message is near real-time or pseudo-real-time uh, is good enough today, but banks should be thinking about what the future looks like and at what point it will no longer be good enough. And by the way, as more and more of your competitors um, move to quicker and quicker near real-time or true real-time, then um, – then it will be harder and harder for you to lag behind. So I said true real time. What are we, what are we talking about that? Um, you know, on the customer facing side, the, the customer experience, which is so important, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, depends on these real time interactions. So it's offers or predictive analytics. What am I going to give them next? Sometimes even before, or very often even before they need, they know it. They know they need it. Uh, the next best action, or even personal financial experiences, um, the, you know, the next evolution in our mind of PFM, or notifications and nudges, those had better be happening um, at the time that an action needs to be taken. And on the customer hidden side or the bank-driven side, fraud is a huge area, and it's becoming increasingly sophisticated. So one thing you obviously want to do is flag fraudulent transactions without adversely affecting that customer experience because there's nothing more annoying to a good customer in particular than having a transaction declined. Um, the other thing that is happening on the fraud side is an increase in ongoing attacks with that are advanced, you know, are called advanced persistent threats. So there's a constant building up of, of ammunition on the part of the fraudsters uh, they are gathering data. They are, are mounting uh, and gathering intelligence to mount their attack, um, and they may be a bunch of little attacks. And then finally, when they figure out where the vulnerability is, they come in. Um, and Stacy, I know, will talk more about APT, but defending against those is becoming increasingly important, and defending against the, the smaller attacks as they happen um, it is critical and a huge use case for real time. The, the other side of this is the expenses um, and expenses that can be reduced. So um, you know, manual exceptions and reconciliations that occur and become harder and more costly to reconcile the longer the time is between uh, the transaction and the reconciliation uh, is, is one key area. Um, predictive maintenance, and again, Stacy will talk about that in, in some more detail, um, is another one, but if you can uh, reduce the number of uh, runs that need to be made to fix a piece of machinery, for instance, uh, to only when you think it's about to break, that saves money right there. And there are other nuances and subtleties that, that you'll talk about. Um, operational risk, um, really, at the end of the day, which encompasses, obviously, a whole range of things, increases when there are these mismatches between systems of record and systems of engagement, particularly when you start bringing other players in the whole banking and financial network into, uh, into play. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've, we've done, and I mentioned customer experience there. Why is that important? Well, for the first time ever, um, as we run this biannual survey of North American retail banks, customer satisfaction and customer relationship is, for the first time, the top priority for retail banks. And 70% said that it was their first or second priority. And that, to us, is unprecedented. Um, every other year we've done this, it has been sales results that this year only came in at 45%, uh, sorry, 41% uh, that were the top boat earner. And this was over 100 banks, so we feel pretty comfortable with this. And it does validate what we've been seeing anecdotally. So real-time as an enabler of customer satisfaction is, is critical. Um, and, again, we see banks uh, reacting to this customer satisfaction imperative. 
we also asked uh, the banks what technologies are going to uh, help you in delivering your top priorities. And the top one, well, we put checks where they can benefit from real time. The top one was the mobile banking channel development, and that has 96% of our respondents saying that is critical. And 96% in anything is virtually unheard of. It's clearly not literally unheard of since we have it here, but mobile is huge. And when you have your phone in your hand, you expect, rightly or wrongly, real time. Uh, omni-channel delivery is another one, 77%. Um, and again, think about opening an account in one channel and consummating that transaction in another. Uh, measuring and optimizing the customer journey has several real-time elements. Personalization certainly uh, does, particularly when you're starting to personalize it to the context, and predictive analytics uh, a fifth. So all sorts of technology priorities are intertwined with real-time here. The other thing that we looked at was what kinds of specific mobile initiatives do you have going? So um, it's in production, it's planning, considering, and no plans. And actionable alerts uh, were, were top. Those clearly have real-time, huge real-time elements. Personal financial management um, was a second appointment booking. You've got to have access to your um, – counterpart calendar to make that viable, photo account opening, uh, yet another. So real-time, again, intertwined throughout the process. Now, we talked a bit about the business case. Uh, we think about most business cases as having three main levers of, you know, typically uh, mitigating risk, increasing revenue, or reducing cost. And uh, there are elements of real time in all these, but risk mitigation uh, is typically the, we think, the strongest value lever uh, for fraud, uh, reducing operational risk, and looking at advanced persistent threats. On the revenue side, it's very often indirect, um, but it can be direct with offers um, in particular. But improving that customer satisfaction, getting next, next best offers um, humming smoothly, and making contextualized offers. And on the cost side, um, you know, you don't have these reconciliation errors as much because it's, you know, it's one and done. It's not one and then we'll settle uh, and clear later on. Um, and that also comes from reducing the back office activity. Um, and predictive maintenance can reduce the number of, you know, of maintenance runs and just save on gas and technician time and uh, a host of other things. So let me conclude with our view on what it is that the banks need to be thinking about with respect to real time today. Um, first key message is don't do everything at once, and, and real time isn't even applicable to everything at once, and you don't need to do a core replacement today and move to a real time core um, to get what you need. Um, pseudo real time is good enough for now, but it won't be forever. And there are some, some really interesting pockets that do benefit from going to true real time. Um, going along with don't do everything at once, you know, start, start with things that you can succeed at and learn from and build on those to get the next project done. Um, be really clear, be ruthless even about choosing the use cases that make economic sense and that you can get buy-in from your colleagues and say, Here's what we aim to achieve in a very quantifiable way, and here's what we achieved, and this is how we did it, and this is what the next project should look like. Um, and start small. Now, don't, don't go out and have this humongous effort that, if it flops, is going to make a splash um, seen across the bank. Um, begin small, minimize costs and your risk, gain experience, and then build up from there. And, and third, you know, Think about migrating to real-time environments across your service environment. So, you know, other people in your ecosystem are going to be doing it. Um, you know, we talked a lot in here about partners, um, about customers, about um, other banks, and 
as that happens, you've got to keep an eye on them and make sure you don't fall too far behind. Um, the risk of pseudo real-time will increase. Customer dissatisfaction will be too high if you aren't keeping up with the marketplace, and uh, ultimately it can really come back to bite you. Um, so with that, uh, I am very happy to, to turn it over to Stacy. Uh, there are my contact details, um, but she will take you into some really interesting specifics um, where real time makes a difference in the business. So, Stacy, over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan, and thanks for sharing your research and doing such a great job of outlining key areas where working with real time data actually makes real sense. Um, you know, be it the mobile customer experience, APT protection, and trying to analyze and catch those small attacks as they happen, or operational re risk management, you know, looking at reducing ops risk. I think these are all valid cases for sure. Um, but thank you also for reminding us that this pro approach is not the be-all answer. Um, in fact, that there are still so many scenarios out there where a little bit of data latency may not make such a huge difference than, you know, these traditional BI tools such as Tableau or relational databases um, using these to get updates once an hour or once every 10 minutes is quite enough. Hang on for one second. For some reason, I can't seem to board my slides. Thank you. Great. Um, I'm not sure if we're forwarding slides here or not from the looks of things. Oh, yeah, we've got it. Good. I'm glad we have a backup computer in the room. So that being said, we are definitely seeing a growing number of use cases where working with real-time data seems to make sense, and this whole slower motion approach to data acquisition and processing is not quite enough. Um, so why is this? Well, I think some of the common characteristics we are seeing real-time use cases including um, would be things such as shrinking decision windows, and I know, Dan, you kind of touched on this as well, um, dealing with time-sensitive use cases where perhaps a delayed reaction could hurt customer loyalty, um, could definitely affect your channel profitability, and, of course, the reputation of your bank. And then there was this idea of um, high-velocity data or the concept of data becoming a wasted asset. And really what that's all about is thinking about, okay, you know, if I look at huge data storms, oh, wow, I'm not sure what's happening here. Um, hang on for just one second. Slight malfunction in the slide deck. There we go. Um, okay, back on track. <laughs> I think. Um, essentially, though, if we look at things such as um, new real-time use cases emerging, such as, um, you know, things that may be a byproduct of continued investment in technology infrastructure as well, things such as decreases in hardware costs, um, technology investment um, in areas such as live data stream streaming off the wire, perhaps scalable data storage or faster processing, um, and even real-time analytics platforms, we definitely have made it way easier for financial institutions to adopt real-time systems. Um, and if you couple this, if you start thinking about all the machine learning and predictive algorithms that are taking um, in effect now, uh, FIs are they're just in a prime position to perform this continuous analysis that needs to happen on data points. Um, and use this information to really make decisions that matter and, you know, that, that are, are punctual. And um, this can also be data that can help you determine any new business path at any time. It's all really powerful stuff when we live in this time, as, as Dan mentioned, of just instant gratification. Um, now, for those of you that don't know a lot about iNetco, we focus on working with banks, credit unions, and payment processors all over the globe. Um, we help these companies to tap into their real-time customer transaction data. And we do this right off the wire. Now, the companies that we work with will often see this data as a 24 by 7 lifeline to their customers, especially those customers that prefer to maybe deal in digital interactions versus branch visits, et cetera. So when we started off, many of our first use cases around real-time transaction data were built 
around IT operations and really looking at application response time scenarios. But these have been expanding as FIs try to match the dynamic nature of their customers, um, where customer satisfaction is all of a sudden becoming a top prior priority. We all saw in the Salent research that I think it was 70% um, of bank, so retail banking um, people that participated in the survey actually started voting this as a top priority. And really, it's omnichannel customer experience. This is also a top priority. So as these... Um, you know, as in addition to these IT ops cases, we're also seeing a variety of use cases related to areas such as risk, security management, um, marketing promotions, channel systems management, and card operations. And really, these are all areas where accessibility to real-time transaction data has become this key um, to making more impactful customer decisions and doing so more quickly and really looking at ways to stay ahead of the competition. Now, interestingly enough, the, um, the drivers that Salent, um, Dan actually mentioned around risk mitigation, revenue uplift, and cost reduction, these are all mirrored in each of the use cases that I am gonna share with you next. And with that, we'll jump into use case number one. And this first use case is all about IT and channel operations, moving towards predictive maintenance, and efficient management of operations environments. Um, there's some definite key challenges that these teams face. Um, we're seeing a shift in what I'm calling operations intelligence. So a movement away from trying to manage each individual application, each individual network, each individual um, relationship with a third party uh, service provider. What we're looking at now is end-to-end -end monitoring um, and, and there's a key reason for this. I mean, transactions today, they do not traverse just one technology. There's usually many technologies, many networks that they need to traverse to complete. Well, if these teams are on the hook for this customer transaction completing, um, they need to be able to vis visually see those transactions regardless of where they start and where they end. Um, of course, this is getting harder to do with more complex transaction environments. All of a sudden we're dealing with, you know, more of a multi-hop, multi-network, multi-protocol environment, and more third-party systems, a lot more APIs being developed. Um, so how do you pin down issues in a timely manner in such a complex environment? Well, this is where real-time transaction data does come in. And the idea here would be that you're about to fix something before it breaks. Um, Essentially, real-time transaction data and access to this helps improve the completion of transaction rates. Um, with transaction data, these teams all of a sudden gain that visibility they need into every customer transaction. They can start using predictive trends uh, based on things such as transaction volumes, uh, transaction types, transaction amounts. Really, you're looking at ways to become more proactive and um, look at proactive ma predictive maintenance versus always being in the reactive mode. You can set real-time alerts, um, and these alerts could be used for slowdowns, failures of transactions. And then you've got the ability to actually drill into each individual transaction and use that information to quickly determine where the issue is occurring. So being able to provide proactively identify things such as slowdowns related to applications, third-party authorization, network communications. This all will have a giant effect on support costs as well as reducing your cost to serve. Now, next what I'm going to share with you is an actual quote from one of our customers, uh, Dr. Stoner Kanko, who is the CEO, CEO of BKM. BKM is a central processor in Turkey uh, they process card and payment transactions for over 29 banks. And at the end of this presentation, we've actually attached a link to a recent press release if you would like to learn their whole story. But really, this is a customer where in the case um, they were adopting a lot of alternative digital service channels, customer experience meant everything to them. And what they were looking for was um, the ability to use real-time data to gain that full visibility into each individual transaction and also, um, you know, be able to decode those transactions to get into the details that we were talking about earlier, the network um, response time, application response time, um, information on whether or not the transaction actually made it to the end authorization host. 
that's all the type of information that um, BKM is currently using to improve the customer experience. And with that, we'll move on to use case number two. And this use case is all based around um, involving risk and security management teams. So it's a fully different um, department, and it's all about their ability to move towards APT um, and anomaly detection in real time. So again, this is looking at those smaller attacks as they happen. Some of the challenges with this, and we all know this already, um, there's a constant change of fraud tactics out there. And really, if a bank wants to be effective, they must move as dynamically as the fraudsters do. Now, we are also seeing an emergence of new vulnerabilities in payment systems. So there's back-end fraud systems in place, and they're running great. But all of a sudden, these front-end attacks, um, you know, a lot of them can, can actually never reach the back-end system. If you've got switch malware in place, for instance, um, there could be velocity attacks or EMV fallbacks occurring on the front end. Um, and these are things that you're going to want to know that may fly under the radar of traditional defenses. Um, those are just some of the examples. And really, if we move forward here. Okay. Um, how does transaction data actually help with this situation? Well, we see this convergence all of a sudden of operations and security tools. We see real-time data um, coming into play with both of these tools, and we can never call an operations tool a fraud management tool. But you do see that there is some overlap happening, especially when we start thinking about predictive trending and identifying abnormal numbers of EMB fallbacks or foreign card transactions or maybe high-volume transactions in real time. We also see um, perhaps we want to isolate transaction anomalies that come from specific terminals used in coordinated attacks or spot cards that maybe there's a high amount or high usage or some sort of foreign usage occurring and doing this in a way before these cards actually make it onto the hot list. These are all uh, ideas around real-time warning systems um, and time series analysis that, that people are using to react a little bit faster to APT de detection and some of the card processing um, protection mechanisms. Next, we have another quote from another customer, um, Eden Red. And for those of you that are familiar with Eden Red, uh, they, they're huge. They actually have about 42 million people using their services in over 42 countries. They're a world leader in prepaid corporate services. They manage employment and social benefits as well as business expense management and incentive and rewards programs as well. Um, for us, we work directly with their team in Mexico and the key reason why they were interested in real-time transaction data was this expansion of prepaid systems. Um, they wanted this to occur without incurring any risk to cu of customer disruptions. Um, using real-time transaction data and alerts, they can now rapidly respond to any anomalies that they catch um, and respond to any critical situations, thus reducing some of the operational risk and the um, risk that's associated with potential fraudulent issues. With that, we'll move on to case number three, and this is our last use case. And this one is all about improving customer experience and card analytics. Um, it's an example how people that I call um, data strategists, and this could be anyone from your analysts to your chief data officer, the CIO that owns the data strategy, marketing folks or channel managers, how do they actually uh, utilize real-time transaction data and how can they do this in a way that's um, enabling them to move as dynamically as their customers move? And I think Dan had some great examples in there about real-time mobile offers. Um, this could also apply to cash management. It could apply to device and ATM placement as well as card promotions. It's really reacting quickly um, when timing is everything. So how does real-time transaction data help? Well, it just means that these teams can now provide a certain level of responsiveness, responsiveness to customers, um, more of the level that they actually expect. So just to give you some examples, you know, this is what will enable people to do dynamic or what we'll call on-the-fly customer segmentation. 
all of a sudden this becomes possible based on their daily habits, based on a life um, decision that they've made, based on perhaps even a salary increase and a note that, you know, there's more being deposited in, into a specific account. There's also real-time offers that can become more relevant based on um, current activity, and that's getting back into mobile offers in particular. And then there's the ability to continuously monitor card program adoption and customer usage across all channels. And this brings a whole new level of agility to decision making um, that can definitely lead to increased profits, um, better retention, more program success, and of course, um, a higher level of customer satisfaction. Now, it can also help with cannibalization. So if you can note that two programs are running in parallel, you know that one program is um, perhaps a higher profit than the other, then you can easily spot that that may be cannibalizing your other program and, um, you know, you can make the appropriate steps to stop that before too much damage is done. So moving on to our last quote of the day, and this comes from BECU, who is a credit card or a credit union that's based in just outside of Seattle, Washington, actually. And in 2016, um, BECU was actually recognized by Senate as a model bank. They were an award winner in the omnichannel banking category. And really what they're doing is they're looking at real-time transaction data and harnessing this data to ensure that their 900,000 plus members are actually able to effectively complete their transactions at any of their touch points, so be it at an ATM, mobile, et cetera. And the idea is anytime, any place. Um, they've also built a really, really cool analytic system, and I know that they're still doing a lot of work on this, but um, it's built on this concept of fast data, where data that can be analyzed, um, as it's actually ingested, you know, it can be essentially ingested at a very high intake rate, um, offering them the ability to make more efficient decisions and um, definitely reduce the risk of any type of operations um, issues that may be happening as they can spot them a lot quicker. And again, this full case study will be down, can be downloaded in a PDF format and that will be available at the end of this presentation. Now with that, I think we have one last poll question. Um, I see that there have already been questions coming in as well, and we will open the Q&A section as soon as this poll question is closed. Okay. And I think there are some results coming in now. The question was, I will be looking at on-demand access to real-time transaction data within the next, is it already deployed, currently deploying or piloting, within the next year, not on the agenda or other? And so far, it doesn't look like it's on the agenda. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Good, I was getting a little scared there. Um, so far, we've got current deploying or piloting, which is excellent. Um, and again, if you have any further questions or need help building out those use cases, let us know. We're always wel you know, welcome any type of inquiries such as that. Already deployed. So 29% of you have already deployed real-time um, data analysis, which is great. And then there's some other, but I'm not sure. If those people that have marked, the 14% that have marked other, um, would like to share within the question box, um, we'd love to know what you're doing. Hmm. Okay. Well, it looks like our results, I think the votes are starting to slow down now. We see 29% of people have already deployed um, real-time transaction data or have access to their real-time transaction data, while 29% are already currently deploying or piloting. You know, um, with close to 60% um, of you already looking into the realm of real-time transaction data, that is definitely, that's impressive. And um, for those 38% of you that are, don't even have it on the agenda yet, um, you know, don't, 
again, I think Dan stressed a very important point, and that's, you know, take your time with this. Make sure you know why you're doing this. Ask yourself the hard questions of, okay, do I really need real time? And if it makes sense for your environment and there's certain questions or certain improvements um, that you've outlined for your company, then by all means, um, you know, there's enough materials out here now where we can help you get going on that. And let's close out that poll. Great. So at this point, I would like to thank everybody for um, attending this webinar, and I hope you found it useful. We're going to open up the floor for questions, Q&A. Um, I see that there's already one question that has come in, and that's, who typically owns the real-time data strategy in a retail bank? And Dan, I know you're still with us. Did you want to um, maybe start us off with an answer to that? Yeah, it's one of the um, the more uh, not not contentious, but it it hasn't really been solved. Um, there are some few banks out there who have a chief data officer. Um, but I think this is also one of those key instances where there is a really important distinction between the systems of record and the systems of engagement. Um, and in fact, in the UK, for instance, their regulator is adamant that there be a clear single owner of those systems of, of record, um, but it doesn't solve the question of who's going to be in charge of those systems of engagement. Um, is it going to be, you know, assuming there's not a chief data officer, um, is it going to be uh, IT? Is it going to be uh, marketing, who's going to serve up all these offers? Is it going to be the line of business so that uh, payments has one cut at it and, um, you know, the head of retail banking has another? It's It's really a bit of a conundrum, and I think going back to what the the listeners put in as uh, their data strategy, it, it hasn't really been cleaned up, but being able to have a coordinated view across the silos where this data sits um, and is, is served from is critical if you're going to be able to get the most out of your, your data. Yeah, I would agree with you, Dan, and I think it's always um, important to think that, you know, as, as well, at least for INECO, where we've got transactions that transcend all boundaries, so there's really no one department that uses transaction data anymore, and that's kind of an old school thought of, okay, um, definitely started with ops, but we're now seeing all these other use cases develop. I think it's really important that um, there's ongoing talks happening between that CIO, the CTO, the marketing team, the CDO, whoever it is that owns that data strategy, um, you know, reaching down into the various departments to understand what type of lens will need to be put on that data is going to be super important. Okay, next question. Oh, this is interesting. No matter what we do as an organization to facilitate true real time, there is an issue of mobile carrier latency. Are there any ways to overcome this? Baja. <laughs> uh oh. Um, Dan, do you want to start off with that one again? Uh, not, not that I know of. <laughs> Other than start your own telco company and fix it. Yeah. Um, I I would, I mean, yeah, fixing it is good. Making sure that you identify, and, you know, this is where I'm not sure if you have a service level agreement already in place, but being able to monitor and actually show the mobile carrier the latency issues, um, that might be of help to you. So sometimes it's that whole blame storm of, no, it's not our issue, it's on your side. But being able to gather the data, and that's, you know, that's another actual use case that, that we've come across in the INECO land as well. But um, being able to showcase that to any third-party provider has sometimes been useful. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think the other bit is just customer education. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there's, it, you know, at least today in our current technology environment with our providers or your providers, um, there's a certain... You know, physical limitation. There's the speed of light that we can't get by. We're doing all we can, but 
at this stage, this is you know, on your telco. Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, here's another question. Is it a question or a statement? I'm trying to figure it out. INECO has built in monitoring capabilities for data collection and further analyze the same. Um, if I understand the question correctly, I think you're asking, can we ingest other data other than transactional data? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, and um, this data does not have to be just real-time data. It could be near real-time. It could be data sets um, that are ingested, such as demographic information, geographic location, that sort of data. Um, you know, and that can be coming from third-party monitoring tools as well. Now, on the reverse side, we can also forward data streams up to other uh, management systems, and that's been done with a couple of our partners, such as Fiserv um, and NCR as well. So there is flexibility for that. Our theory, or our our, ment um, our, our emerging mantra lately has been, um, you know, we if you can provide the data. And it's all about that data capture. I think we've, we've actually overcome one of the hardest hurdles in this whole um, idea of real-time analysis, for sure. Okay. And then I think we've got time for one or two more questions. There's one that's kind of a general. What appears to be the biggest hurdle to a real-time data strategy so far? Um, Dan, yeah. do you want to start? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would go back to um, to really that organization. I mean, the and you know, the the technological um, aspect of of analyzing the data in real time in in some ways is the easiest. Um, what's harder is getting all the data in the form that can be analyzed um, in real time and, and served up in real time. And I don't mean to minimize the technological stuff, but the other stuff is even harder. Um, but to get the data served up in the right format and in the right place requires the right organization. Um, and like so much technology stuff these days, um, getting the organization right is a, a necessary but not a sufficient condition. Great. I would agree. I mean, Internal company culture comes up again and again, and I think in the poll questions that we asked, that became a very, um, you know, I think it was it was the skills and the resources that became, it, it became very evident that that's still a major hurdle for a lot of us to overcome, for sure. Um, this other question, are security and ops tools really converging? And I don't mind starting with that one because I think I mentioned it when I was talking about our second use case for risk management. Um, again, I would state that you will never see, you know, or at least I have yet to see ops tools being called fraud tools, but you are seeing an overlap. Um, you know, almost every monitoring vendor out there seems to be feeling some sort of a confluence point when it comes to security and operations. Um, and I think we need to accept that that's going to happen. Um, you know, and if if we can help somehow in the APT arena where we're looking at, you know, the smaller attacks but being able to identify those before they become a major issue or controlling those APTs, then by all means, um, there's no reason why an ops tool couldn't be used by your security team as well. And again, um, back to that whole, I think it was the second question that was asked about um, data coming from third-party monitoring tools. You can also stream real-time data into other platforms, you know, that may be specialized in fraud or cash management, fleet management, um, other operation intelligence tools, any other customer segmentation tools. The use for the data itself is really um, quite, quite broad. So that's where, um, you know, really working if you are somebody that owns the data strategy, really working with the various teams and understanding what type of lens you want to put on the data gets to be pretty important. Good. And at that point, I think we're up to the end of our hour here. Again, a big thank you to Dan and Selent for coming and joining us on this webinar today. Thank you to all of you for actually attending today. And if you have any questions, by all means, Contact information is on this slide. Um, feel free to contact us at any time.
And with that, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.